The football season has finally arrived. K-State and UT Martin getting ready to kick off on Saturday night, 6 o'clock, the customary first game of the season against an FCS opponent where the Wildcats will host the game. Night kick for everybody. And I honestly, the number one story for me going into this game, D.Y., I just want to get this out of the way right now. It's the weather. It's how perfect things are looking to be in Manhattan. Saturday night. I mean, we're, it's going to be mid 80s throughout the day. And then by kickoff, I think it's going to be low 80s. It'll probably dip into the 70s by the time the game is over. You're going to get one of the most pleasant starts to the season that anybody could envision because there have been plenty of hot ones. Uh, so I think that's the thing I'm most excited about is this is going to feel amazing to show up for the first game of the season and the weather is going to treat you right. Yeah. Uh, can't argue with that. I would say shutout streak. Does it stay alive against the FCS? Uh, and it's not a long streak. Obviously, it's two games, but <laughs> but uh, that's still something, right? Mm -hmm. And and they had a few shutouts last year, I think, in, in the twenty two season. I mean, if you look at some of, there are some impressive defensive performances both in the non con and the conference play, both in twenty two and twenty three, and we think this year's defense is going to, you know probably match that or maybe even eclipse it so it'll be interesting i i think they might give up some points this time there it might be just coach speak even from the players but they're giving ut martin quite a bit of respect uh the last two seasons four shutouts two last year to the year prior to that um and then it, you'd have to go back and uh the last season before 20 uh, 22 with a shutout was the 2019 season when in Chris Kleiman's second game, they won 52 to nothing over Bowling Green. Um, but then to find a stretch where you've had four shutouts in two years, that kind of rolling total is impressive. So that's another thing you're looking to add to, not just, hey, pitch it three straight and against these opponents, but actually come through and start to tally this up. Because not a lot of teams, I would imagine, throughout the country have – pitched four shutouts the last two seasons like that is a tough thing to do even when you're playing a bad team I mean think about the TCU game last year K-State dominated TCU they still managed to get three points like they still found a way to kick a field goal uh it, it's it is an impressive streak for the K-State defense before we get the 2024 season started I want you to know that there's no better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on the K-State Wildcats in Dublin, Ireland. Yep, that's right. The Cats are going over to participate in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin. They will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. Whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. So all that is uh, taken care of with all the wonky week zero games this year. It's time for week one and the real deal. K-State, UT Martin. Uh, D.Y., I'll just start with the – I mean, we, we've talked a lot about the defense and everything, but I think we have to remember Avery Johnson is playing quarterback in this game. So let's talk Avery Johnson to get this thing started. What is a good realistic expectation for people on Saturday night? Because to me, like he did nothing last year to bring the hype down, yeah, he even did. a tick. He may have elevated with the fact that yep. he was so awesome and saved him against Texas tech. And then he came out and they never trailed against NC state. They felt like they were always in control he made the smart play. He also made the wow plays. The momentum that he has going into this season, it, it's it's as high as it could be, which is impressive. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us think that he could make an all Big 12 team as a quarterback, and, and I don't really remember any Kansas State quarterback flirting with that, at least in my time covering the team, despite you know really good seasons from Will Howard and Skylar Thompson. Uh, so he's he's beloved already in Manhattan. There's not a lot that he could do to deter people from being excited about him. I would just say even a mundane performance against UT Martin, and we might get one because I think it's going to be kind of vanilla, is going to be fine here. 
Uh, don't try to do too much. Really, I would like him to. I think the most important thing for me would be for him to continue what he did against NC State. And I know he wasn't the most efficient that day, but but a lot of that was being so careful with the ball that he threw it away. And I don't think he was being risk averse that day. I think he was making the smart football play because that's what he does. And the receivers really didn't get open. Now, he had some mechanical errors and flaws there, like when he tried to throw on the run at times and, and skipped it. Uh, so you'd like to see maybe him be more effective while throwing on the run if he ever has to do that against UT Martin. But more than anything, I want him to kind of be the floor general distributor against UT Martin. Uh, less runs. I mean, they, they shouldn't need his legs. I know it's fun to watch him be explosive with his legs and really take off for an 80-yard run. I just don't know that you even want to tempt fate against UT Martin and do that when you can just give the ball to Dylan Edwards and DJ Giddens and Keegan Johnson and Jace Brown and Garrett Hoakley and Dante Cephas and Jaden Jackson and Trey Spivey, maybe Joe Jackson. You know, the, He's got more weapons, to Will Howard's point. He's got more weapons this year than Will Howard had last year. Well, so I think that's another good thing to talk about with Avery Johnson. What If you were in control of the game plan on Saturday night and the game plays out the way that we think it's probably going to, what would your breakdown look like? How many runs are you giving Avery Johnson? Are you trying to cap it at a certain point? What What is yeah. the expectation and goal there? I don't know what the expectation and goal is. I know that I would – probably unload two or three design runs just to to do the play so the offense has experience doing the play seeing how it works seeing who's doing what um because just saying we don't want to run avery johnson and not calling a play well now the other guys on the team don't have the experience of running that play when you do call it in a tight situation against Tulane or arizona so i think you need to go to those three or four base runs, base QB runs that you're really going to lean on this year and call those at periodical points of the game just to garner that experience, really. But aside from that, I mean, you wanted to improve the passing game. You want to be a little risk averse when it comes to Avery's legs. Throw the ball around um, a lot, yeah. I think. Yeah, and I mean, this is... I was... And DJ Gins has been banged up a little bit in the offseason, so... Yeah, and, and to me, like you, you look at UT Martin and the way that they they set up, the offense is the strength for UT Martin. They they bring back their quarterback, who was an Ole Miss transfer. Uh, they did lose their running back to Oklahoma this offseason, but mm -hmm. there were a lot of other things that like they're experienced on the offensive line. They're defensively, though, the really only experienced spot that they're heavy in is their defensive line, but they struggled defensively last year they only forced 11 turnovers 27 sacks gave up over 350 yards a game and th they were really solid against the run but they struggled in their pass defense which really sets up for kind of the perfect game for k-state we think the defense is ready to handle a lot of things that get thrown their way so a veteran and strong offense from ut martin should not be a problem for k-state and then offensively for the wildcats you go this is setting up to where you want to throw the ball quite a bit. You want to figure out who's going to be your pass catchers. You want to see Avery Johnson sling it. You want to keep run the running game healthy. Th this is setting up for you to do that. So this is actually – K-State's made all these FCS matchups under Chris Kleiman look favorable, but I think this also sets up in a very favorable way for him uh, with the way that they're going to handle things. Uh, and and I would, I'm would i with you. I, I would go maybe at, at the end of the night, Avery Johnson, like, seven carries stands out to me you yeah. probably have like scrambles couple yeah scrambles. three or four that were designed and i bet he doesn't even get touched on some of those like all of them maybe they'll have it schemed up so well and then the others it'll be like the touchdown he had in the pop tarts bowl where it's a pass but boy it's there he's gonna make something special happen and it just happens uh we're not going to see him have to tote this thing even double digit times, I would guess, unless he happens to get sacked, which seems unlikely because he took zero sacks last year. And like I just said, UT Martin wasn't very good at it last season. And he was careful with the ball while throwing it, deciding to throw it or not. A couple of fumbles, though. So you got to watch yep, that true. a little bit. So the fumbles thing, you got to 
watch that a little bit. I agree on the FCS thing, uh, with the exception being, uh, unfortunately, Southern Illinois in 2021. Yeah. Yeah, the Southern Illinois, weird year though. That was Skyler, Skyler got, got hurt. hurt. Will yeah. Howard had to play most of it, so we'll uh, we'll excuse that one. And yeah, twenty twenty one. It's so weird. We everybody talks about are they going to go three and zero in the non con this year? Myself included, because it feels like they haven't done it since twenty nineteen. People forget that they did it in twenty twenty one. It just wasn't very pretty slash very fun. Except so. the Nevada game because everyone thought Nevada was going to be good that year because yeah. they had Carson Strong a quarterback and they cruised. Yeah, yeah, that, that that was so strange that Nevada game because that Nevada team should have been solid and they struggle with Southern Illinois, but it was probably because Daniel and Matter Bebe set the tone for start the game, big touchdown right there. And who was the power four? Uh, Stanford in Arlington. Oh yeah, that was there. Okay. So, which they, they you know they K State pretty much yeah. controlled that game from the jump there. They, and, they uh, did better against Stanford and Nevada than they did at Southern Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> Very strange how that worked out, which some of these FCS teams uh, certainly can end up doing. So, uh, all right, with with the K-State game plan in total, anything that overly concerns you uh, that you'll be keeping an eye on in this game, or is it FCS, they're going to roll, I'm not worried about anything? I'll bring up something to watch, and it's the offensive line. Uh, how's that look? Because you feel like you have the advantage everywhere. Now you should still have the advantage on the offensive line, but they're new. They 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 could have a rough quarter or something. If they're dominant, I love it. If they struggle for more than a quarter, then then you have question marks going into the other games on the schedule. Yeah, that that was one of the things I you know, I didn't have a ton of concerns going into this game, but I did start to think probably last night, I said to myself, man, you know, like the offensive line is going to be interesting to watch just because it would be apparent if things aren't going well. And that would be concerning if they're not going well against UT Martin. Uh, we know that they're going to have options to try and, and throw different guys in there, at least to a certain extent, if things are struggling. But uh, that that is going to be pretty fascinating. I think the other thing to me is, I, I know I just said UT Martin's got a pretty experienced offensive line. They do. Uh, four of the starters are fifth-year guys, and then the only one that isn't, is their right tackle who he's a red shirt junior. So they've got experience there, but I, I'm going to be focusing on what we see the defensive ends do because so much of what caused struggles last year, I think enforcing turnovers. Yes. Part of it was Marquis Siegel dropping the ball or whatever else, but a lot of it I think had to do with the defensive line. Didn't make the quarterback as uncomfortable as K state had the prior two seasons because so many of the the big plays that you think K State made in 2022 down the stretch, it was because they were getting to the quarterback, and even if it didn't result in a pick, they were getting just some easy incompletions that you weren't even worried about being completed. So I'm going to be focused on that, how that rotation works out, because um, similar to the wide receivers, feels like there's a lot of guys that they trust to kind of throw at the problem, but all throughout the year, game by game, I think guys in those two position groups are going to be fighting to command more opportunities throughout the next game. So, you know, whatever is done with the receivers and, and edge guys in the game against UT Martin will probably dictate the guys that get the first cracks against Tulane and so on until this team feels like they've kind of found the balance and, and the, the look that they want. I probably am more curious to watch the offensive line, but – and I'm not concerned about the edge guys. I think they'll find guys that can do it. I'll be curious on which ones those are. Or do you rotate six or seven years? That's that's a long rotation. Yeah, that, it'll be very fascinating to see how uh, that ends up kind of going on. All right, let's break it up here. And uh, we'll get back to K-State UT Martin with our picks, predictions, all that. Also take a look around the Big 12 in just a moment. But uh, it's... The most exciting part of the week, what everybody looks forward to in a game week. It's best bets time as we uh, give you three picks throughout college football this weekend that we think are the best bets that you can find. Uh, last year, D.Y. got on a heater, did pretty well by the end of it. Uh, I think I got myself all confused and outworked. So we'll see. New year, new me, ready to rock with this. Uh, here is a look at the first set of best bets this week. Mine are on the left side of your screen. DYs are on the right. Hopefully that's self-explanatory enough, but that's what we got cooked up. 
Uh, I'll fire away first. I've got UCLA minus 14 at Hawaii. I think UCLA is not a very good team, but I think Hawaii is even worse and like way worse. I mean, 35 to 14 against Delaware State last week. That's embarrassing, especially when one of their scores came off of like a really short punt that they took back. So give me UCLA minus 14. Georgia minus 12 and a half. I'm not, you know, I don't think Georgia is the dominant force they once were. Their defense is still going to be really good. Their offense is good enough. And I am a Dabo Sweeney disbeliever right now. I don't think Clemson uh, is going to be able to hang inside of two touchdowns. That line's actually gone down throughout the week. It was minus 14 uh, earlier in the week. And then my last one, the under in Iowa, Illinois State. This feels like a lock anytime you take an Iowa under, but that's under 40 and a half. Uh, I don't think the Redbirds score a whole lot. Sorry, Jake Rubley and Xavier Lloyd. Uh, don't think you're going to be finding the end zone. But I also don't think that Iowa's offense is going to have the juice to score 33 points on their own or something throughout the game. So uh, Iowa probably wins that game like 24 to nothing or something. I like it. Uh, the, I'm impressed that you like had details on the Hawaii-Delaware State game, considering it was a pay-per-view. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I think, where did I watch highlights? Somebody, <laughs> I saw highlights somewhere, so I did watch them to see part of it. Uh, the guy that scored on the punt return was a dude that is like a freshman, may have gotten like some all-conference honors, was uh, highly thought of, and then didn't do a whole lot last year, but, you know, they're hoping for big things from him, so shout out to Hawaii's punt returner. A little bit of a rant, a rant not rant, but off topic too, like, that game was pay-per-view. How many people do you think paid? Uh, I don't know. And I looked at it just cause like, you know, if it's five bucks, like I was helping my brother-in-law move all last weekend or on Saturday. So late at night. I didn't get to see a ton of the games throughout the day, like in full chunks, like I wanted. So I was so down. I was like, if it's like five, $10, I will pay that to watch this game. It was some astronomical price. <laughs> like it, I don't even like, if I was a Hawaii fan, I'm not even sure that I would want to pay that price to watch a crappy football team. I get the uh, Dabo disbelief at this point, but I got a suspicion. Year two with Garrett Riley as OC. Clemson looks a little bit better on that side of the ball. Uh, so I could see that being Which tight. makes sense because if we're looking to figure out why TCU was so bad last year, right. maybe it's because you are you were missing Garrett Riley from your uh, national championship runner-up team. Yeah, so I could see that maybe being tight. I, I'm starting to, especially seeing Florida State look the way they did. Maybe that's a, maybe that was a fluke. I don't know, but I think that ACC is starting to open up a little bit. Yeah, for for uh, for a my or sorry, Clemson. Iowa under is always safe, so I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm gonna quibble you there. Mine, as you see, I'm a Big Twelve hater. Apparently, fading Big Twelve. Yes. All three wow. Of those. Yeah, that was uh, nasty work by you. I, there's also a fourth one I like, but I didn't see it until later, but, and I can mention it afterwards. You guys know, if anyone's been listening to like the last month, I, I, I'm definitely a West Virginia hater. So Penn State minus 7.5. I'm also, people listening, I've been kind of a Penn State believer, which is wild because everyone thinks I'm crazy for it, and I probably am. But I just I can see more reasons to fade the other top teams in the Big Ten in Ohio State with the – quarterback play and and all the pressure that's on them this year michigan uh, new coach uh basically an entire new roster and then with oregon new team new league i i don't like to pick them to win the conference and then penn state I actually like what they did in the offseason i think they hired one of the best offensive coordinators in yeah. college football and andy kotelnicki and maybe drew a lot drew aller doesn't look so bad so and in west virginia i just think that they capitalized off a pretty Simple schedule last year when they played top 35 teams last year, two of them, they lost by three touchdowns. So you're giving me just one. I'll do it. Um, so Penn State, Arizona State, well, Wyoming, some coaching change here. So I, I don't feel as confident, but it, look, I, I just think Arizona State is basically a glorified group of five team right now, the way that they are constructed. So give me Wyoming if you're going to give me more than a touchdown. Oklahoma State always starts out slow. Mike Gundy's kind of like that kind of coach, slow starter, South Dakota State. They're better than the North Dakota State team that everyone just watched on Thursday night. So nine and a half's a lot. And it was ten and a half. 
uh, before that. So if you got it at that, you're even looking better. But I think that that's probably a real easy pick. And and the one I saw later was I forget what the exact number is is the under at Michigan Fresno State because you got to think Michigan's defense mm-hmm. is still really nasty. Uh, Fresno State might not score, and Fresno State just had a surprise coaching change like a month ago. So they're kind of in disarray. Meanwhile, Michigan, their new head coach, yeah, he was an offensive coordinator, but he was also an offensive line coach that, while having a first-round quarterback, chose not to even throw the ball in one of the halves last year, right? They went an entire second half without calling a pass play. That means the clock's going to be running. He's a guy that's really, I think he's more ground and pound than anything, uh, less possessions, less points. So I don't know what the exact number is, but that Michigan Fresno State under, not one of my official picks, obviously, even though I wish it could be. Um, I think it's really appealing. Yeah, uh, I the the Michigan Fresno State game is is kind of fascinating to me. And Michigan's twenty one and a half point favorite in that game. I their offense is just going to be such an unknown to kind of watch uh, with everything. Really good running back. So, yeah, yeah, really good running back, Donovan Edwards. Yeah, they'll probably feed him. So uh, we'll we'll see how it goes. But yeah, I. I'm. I wouldn't have any big issues with uh, any of your picks against the Big Twelve teams. Uh, Wyoming's just too much of an unknown for me right now. Uh, and, but so is the Arizona State like quarterback thing. Like you just don't really know. They're so hampered by the Herm Edwards stuff still, and trying to build out of that giant hole, and the fact that they had you know administrators at their school that did not value the athletics programs at all. Uh, so I don't know what to do. And I, I'm also with you on. South Dakota State plus nine and a half. I think that's a it game win. that win. Yeah, I think that's a game that no matter what side it ends up going to, uh, I think it probably comes down to like the last play. Like I could see Alan Bowman pulling the rabbit out of his hat somehow. He's been bad all game and he makes a play and they win it at the horn. Or uh, South Dakota State comes away with it on some crazy play and breaks Oklahoma State hard. So it'll be fascinating to watch because O State. They love to screw around in those games more than about anybody else in the Big 12. Yeah, remember, there was that crazy Central Michigan game a few yep. years ago. Uh, last year, they lost to South Alabama by nearly three scores. Yes, and they've had some other close calls uh, throughout their time False there. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how that ends up uh, playing out. And I think – does O-State play at Tulsa this year, I believe? Uh, I think it's I think yeah. it's their year to go to Tulsa uh, for their little rivalry there. So we'll be fascinating to watch and uh, where things go from there. All right. Uh, rolling on now, let's go back to K-State and UT Martin and talk about your game MVP picks on offense and defense. Uh, who steps up and carries the load offensively for K-State in this game? Because these FCS games, is not as cut and dry as just being able to say Avery Johnson. It could be somebody else. Uh, so what do you got? And I think they'll be willing to take the ball out of Avery Johnson's hands too, uh, and legs. So I, I actually think not going with Avery Johnson is the smart play. Probably not going with DJ Gins just because I think they're going to ease him into the process. There's nothing concerning going on there. He's just, you know, was was basically handled with kid gloves in training camp. So I wouldn't expect a big burst out of him in week one because of that. Uh, maybe his coming out party is the, probably the following week. Uh, when they play Tulane in New Orleans and want to be maybe a little bit more physical. I think this one uh, probably want to be a little bit more explosive. And if you're taking it out of Avery's hands and if you're taking it out of DJ Ginn's hands, it's going to be in Dylan Edwards' hands. And I think he has multiple touchdowns. All right. I like that one. Uh, For me, on the offensive side of the ball, uh, it's tough to to pick a guy and to go either way. Um, But I... I think one of the receivers maybe rises to the occasion here. And I know last night uh, that everybody, I probably think that I'm a hater now of Keegan Johnson, but I was just saying that I'm not like blindly going to follow and believe the hype. I need to see it, but I do think that I see it on Saturday night. And like, this is the game to step up and do it. Like prove you're healthy, prove you can dominate inferior talent with UT Martin. Uh, so I think Keegan Johnson explodes in a big way to start the season and uh we'll we'll see what that ends up looking like tomorrow night so i do think it's dylan or a receiver is the best answer yeah. for sure uh it'll be in, like it would be crazy dante Sivas just comes out and catches 10 balls yeah that and that would i mean the hype train of the season just goes to a brand new level of dante Sivas 
Looks like Kent State, Dante Cephas. Uh, defensive side of the ball, this is another one where you could kind of have a feast or famine type game. Uh, who is your defensive MVP? I'm going to pick a defensive end. The strength of UT Martin is on the interior of the offensive line, which makes me think that if their pass rush is improved and that they got some guys that can really get after it, they're going to have an opportunity on the edge to get by these tackles that maybe aren't as good as the guards in the center. And I think Kansas State will probably want to be a little bit more aggressive and unleash those guys just to really get a sample size of which ones they're going to go with in the future, right? Um, picking which one a little bit harder. So I, I'm going to go Toby Osinsami. Uh Wow. I, I think he gets uh, – the other guys are a little bit younger, and I know he's a little he's inexperienced at defensive end. But I think he would probably be the biggest mismatch when we're considering a team being FCS and maybe not being as talented. Then the the super fast and super explosive guy, just like Dylan Everett on offense, is probably something that they can't really handle. Well, I'm I'm number one excited to hear you say that. Uh, we found out last night uh, that on the stream that Cole Manbeck is also in the. This is a big season for Toby Austin Sami. Um, I am probably going to I was going to probably take him honestly if you didn't I was stunned to hear you go that way because I think you acted like I was crazy uh when that went down but no, uh take him no I don't want to be the same I'll give I'll give somebody different I mean I've been saying that Marquis Siegel has a big year and the best time to get a pick six is against an FCS quarterback uh so give me Marquis Siegel he's going to make his presence felt He'll get at least one pick uh, on Saturday night, and maybe he takes it to the house just to make me feel better about myself. So I'm giving the love to to Marquis Siegel pick, there, who pick. I'm a big fan of. And your buddies now, yeah. Yeah, we are we are buddies now. Well, maybe I think we are. He may not have viewed it as such a bonding experience. Uh, all right, time for your game picks. I have K State winning 49 nothing. I think they pitched the third straight shutout. I've been pretty firm on that prediction. I'm not moving off of it. The offense is going to look great. The defense is going to ball out. It would take some kind of wacky play or UT Martin just breaking off a big one randomly uh, because a couple things break down to score in this game. I think K-State wins easily, and they definitely cover that 37-and-a-half number. I think I saw it at 36 now, so it's, I don't know if it's coming down. Uh, that was on DraftKings. I got it 45-3. to three. I got a cover as well. Um, I don't see much resistance. I don't see them looking past or not respecting an FCS team considering where their coaching staff came from. And I also think it's easy not to overlook an FCS team in week one when you're just excited to be out there and want to play college football again. So uh, I don't see any problems. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to what K-State and UT Martin have in store. All right. Uh, let's finish things off by talking about the Big 12 with our Big 12 scoreboard this week. Look at news and scores from around the league. And since things kicked off on Thursday night with a handful of games, we actually have four finals at the time of recru recording this on Friday. TCU and Stanford are going to go tonight, but UCF takes down New Hampshire 57-3. to KU takes down Lindenwood 48-3. to Utah blasts Southern Utah 49 to nothing. And then the game that we all thought could be close and interesting was close and interesting. And Deion Sanders tried his best at one point to give North Dakota State a real chance. In fact, their, their prayer at the end of the game landed at the five-yard line. They caught the ball at the five-yard line, but Colorado prevails with a 31-26 to win uh, against North Dakota State before they have to go play Nebraska next weekend. Uh, takeaways from the first night of games in the Big 12. I thought Utah was the only one that looked really clean, uh, and that probably shouldn't come across as a surprise, but the, they just had no issues. You look at the scores for UCF and KU, and you probably think it was pretty simple for them too, but you have to take into some, some context of how both of those teams started. UCF looked like a disaster in the first six or seven minutes before kind of easing into the game, and maybe that's just the week one jitters. Who knows? But I didn't think that they were – really crisp or, or clean and nothing that really scared me. Um, I'm not going to jump to conclusions, but they looked worse than I thought they would look uh, UCF and especially KJ Jefferson, a quarterback before, before settling down, you look at the score K, you probably think, you know, why, why are we doing that? But they also started pretty slow. And I think the context there is Jalen Daniels didn't necessarily look like Jalen Daniels yet. 
and they probably played the worst team a power four team has played in perhaps ever. Uh, not ever because they were playing the teens played really jokes back in a long time ago, but it's been a long time since we've seen Kate, uh, a power four team play a team such as Lindenwood. So uh, that would be my takeaway there. Colorado, you know, for the most part, they weren't terrible. North Dakota State maybe a little bit better than people thought at the in Dion still really bad coaching, especially late yeah. in the game. When when it's situational coaching is required of Colorado, they always implode. So I think that's an issue still for the Buffaloes, and, and that's how I feel about that. I, I guess I'm wondering where all the people are going to come in and be like, now we're a little bit leery of Colorado because most of the media, the hype before, at least the media that has been supportive of Dion, say, oh, Colorado's got this thing together and they're going to cover against North Dakota State. They didn't cover. Yeah, I, and the defense just looked like uh, a revolving door to start the game. And that was kind of the thing where Colorado, I didn't think they were going to lose last night, but I did think North Dakota State would cover because – Colorado has athletes and talent that North Dakota State has never seen and will never see again, even next year when they play another Power 5 school. Like, Colorado just has dudes like Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter that are elite talents that are going to stress you out as a defense, but they were able to score, so is North Dakota State. Just came down to, you know, there were a couple of things went the way of Colorado, uh, so I'm not overwhelmed by uh, Colorado anyway. I think that this is still not a very good football team. Elsewhere, yeah, UCF getting off to the slow start was weird, but they they finished strong. They, back-to-back years, they've really blown out that opening opponent uh, who they've played. Utah, I didn't catch a ton of, uh, but what I did see, it's like you said, it was clean, it was crisp, and I think that's a – like Kyle Whittingham wasn't going to let them come out and be flat, which is what I would tell K-State fans is good news. Chris Kleiman is going to be the exact same way, like, the way Kyle Whittingham and Utah look, looked is going to be basically the same way that K State uh, ends up looking uh, on Saturday. And then uh, KU, there was just, they're clearly working through some things still with their offense. Like their defense made another big play last night. Melo Dotson had another pick six, which I saw that was his third pick six of his career. Uh, and I think that's now makes him the all time leader. Uh, at KU or ties him for the record for most pick sixes in a career, which is kind of crazy to think about that number being there, uh, especially when, you know, a guy like Bobby Walker had uh, two pick sixes in like a three-play stretch against Iowa State uh, in the early 2000s. Um, then uh, the other thing that I would point out about last night was Jalen Daniels did still make some throws that you go, yeah, he's still got the talent there. But he also made some, which he's been prone to do in his career, that are a little silly. Uh, and then he only played a half. That All the other starters went back out there. Cole Ballard came in to start the second half. So uh, that'll be interesting to watch how they manage him throughout the year. Uh, moving on to Saturday's slate, the start of it all, Penn State and West Virginia, South Dakota State at Oklahoma State. Cincinnati will beat Towson. Uh, West Virginia beat the snot out of Towson last year. North Dakota at Iowa State, Tarleton State at Baylor, and UNLV at Houston. Really three interesting games there. Penn State, West Virginia, just to see what kind of juice the Mountaineers have. And then South Dakota State, could they pull off the upset? Oklahoma State would certainly be susceptible. And then Houston and UNLV, first look at Willie Fritz. And uh, not really sure what that that's going to look like there. Like Houston could come out and be a 5-7, and 6-16 six and 16 this year. But there's also a really good chance that there's just so much work that has to be done. They're sitting at like two and ten, three and nine. But fascinating opponent with UNLV, who was good last year, lost their quarterback to USC, though. Yeah, I think Houston's going to be in a dogfight. I think South or I think Oklahoma State is going to be in the dogfight. By the way, I got Oklahoma State on today. And uh and I think there's a chance West Virginia gets the doors blown off of them. But that's just that's just my take. Yeah, we know you like the uh, the minus seven and a half there. Last half of games on Saturday, not a ton of interesting ones. K State hosting UT Martin. Abilene Christian goes to Texas Tech. That's the uh, I don't know if you saw the Sunday show, but Drew said feels like uh, this is like the fifth time in a row that Texas Tech has played Abilene Christian in a season. And I went and looked. This is the first time they are ever play- or this is the first time since 1929 that they're playing Abilene Christian. Uh, or sometime around in the 20s or 30s. So that was a funny moment. They'll win by a lot. 
Southern Illinois and BYU, that game's been floating around like a two-touchdown line, uh, so that could be interesting. And then Arizona and New Mexico followed up by Wyoming and Arizona State to close out the night. Uh, no, no, the last one, Wyoming, Arizona State, could be interesting. Arizona, I bet, beats New Mexico pretty easily, even yeah. though New Mexico scrapped pretty good with Montana State last week. I think that might be the biggest blowout of all those games. Even the K-State one, I think that one could be 50-plus. Like, it could get out of hand. I don't think New Mexico is going to be hanging around with Arizona for very long. And, and by the way, the, the number on that game is only 31, if, if you agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that may not be a bad thing. I, I believe in Bronco Mendenhall long-term. Like, I think last week was actually an encouraging thing. They just weren't able to finish, and Arizona's going to be a totally different beast. Uh, Fafita and McMillan will probably run it yeah. up on them. I thought their luck ran out at the end of last week and, you know, having already played a game and maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. know. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see how it all plays out this weekend, but that will do it for us. We're out of here for Derek Young. I'm Mason Vogue. Thanks for watching the KSO show. Plenty of coverage to lead you up to K-State and UT Martin over at on3 at kstateonline.com and right here on the KSO YouTube and podcast platforms. If you missed any part of the live show, go back, listen, or watch. Wyatt Thompson was on with us. He was great. And uh, everybody else that joined us gave us a lot of good stuff last night as well. So we are out of here. We'll talk to you again, uh, I don't know, Saturday night after uh, probably a K-State victory.